Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Russia's World. We have a very special guest today. He's an eminem, the eminent eminem of neuroscience, Dr. Mark Matson. How are you doing today? I'm good, Doresh. It's good to see you uh, in person, virtually, anyway. <laughs> Wonderful. And so I'd like to start off with, could you briefly introduce yourself? Because you're, you're, you're a man of many talents. So uh, what would you say about yourself? Here? Oh, my gosh. So I grew up on a farm in Minnesota. And I was going to, I wanted to be a veterinarian. My father and grandfather and me, my brother trained and raced harness horses. They're trotters, pacers, and they pull a cart race. And, um, but I didn't get into veterinary medicine school. So uh, I, I decided to go to graduate school. So because I was, uh, you know, failed in getting to veterinary medicine school, I became a neuroscientist eventually, I guess. But yeah, so then um, I started out, did a master's degree in endocrinology, studying how a hormone called ACTH, which is produced by the pituitary, pituitary gland in response to stress, how that acts on cells in the adrenal gland to induce the production of the steroid cortisol. Mm -hmm. And then my PhD work at University of Iowa was neuroendocrinology uh, in crabs, studying a neuroendocrine system that controls molting. It's very interesting. So you and brought then, in the animals again that way. So uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, and then my postdoc work in Colorado was when I started in hardcore neuroscience. There, I essentially my main finding was that glutamate, which is the major or the only excitatory amino acid transmitter, um, it plays a role before synapse formation during the development of the brain and controlling the outgrowth of dendrites and the formation of synapses. This was in the 1980s, and at that time, it was thought that neurotransmitters only act once synapses have been formed. Mm. But So that finding was kind of important because it established a role for this neurotransmitter. Then I got interested in cell death and age-related neurodegenerative disorders simply because I, I was most of my work, my postdoc was in cultured neurons, from embryonic rat brain. Hmm. We take them from the embryos, brain region called the hippocampus, which is very important for learning and memory. We separate the cells and put them in a culture dish. They start out, they attach as spheres, and then over hours and days, they grow neurite processes, and one starts to grow really fast. It becomes the axon, the others grow and branch and become the dendrites. But anyway, it turns out you can kill neurons with high levels of glutamate. It's a process called excitotoxicity. So as its name implies, neurons can be excited to death. That occurs in somewhat in severe epileptic seizures. Um, it also plays a role in the death of neurons following, following a stroke or a traumatic brain injury to some extent. And we think based actually a lot on work I, I did uh, while we were at the National Institute on Aging, that uh, kind of a subtle, insidious form of excitotoxicity occurs in Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got interested in intermittent fasting uh, yeah. because we, we, there were some models of all animal models of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, epilepsy. Some of them, and the first ones we studied was um, models where you you administer toxins, neurotoxins to the animals. So there's this certain neurotoxins that selectively kill dopamine neurons, the neurons that degenerate in Parkinson's. There's other toxins that actually cause excitotoxicity, but fairly selectively in hippocampal neurons. And so, but we know for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's stroke, the main risk factor is age, particularly when you get into your 60s and definitely 70s and 80s in particular. 
that's when people, uh, if they're going to get Alzheimer's, they start to develop symptoms. And so we knew that chlor caloric restriction in rats or mice and, and even in monkeys extends their lifespan. We know that humans who overate, overeat, which is the converse of <laughs> calorie restriction, they have a shortened lifespan, you know, because they're at increased incidence of diabetes, heart disease, cancers. So anyway, we had these animal models of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and stroke. And instead of doing daily calorie restriction, we decided to do every other day food deprivation or every other day fasting. And that had, had been shown to extend lifespan in rats and mice. And we found that in our animal models of those of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, and even epilepsy, uh, we can we were able to protect neurons and improve the functional outcome. So in the Alzheimer's models, um, fewer hippocampal neurons degenerated, and they had less deterioration in their learning and memory ability. In the Parkinson's, we assess body movements, and, uh, and but anyway, so yeah, and so that's um, and then I'm almost done now. Then over the next, probably from 2000 and actually beginning in about the year 2000, we started to look kind of intensively at the cellular molecular level to try to figure out what, what explains the neuroprotective effect of intermittent fasting. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. So for intermittent fasting, you have a book you've written, The Intermittent Fasting Revolution, The Science of Optimizing Health and Enhancing Performance. And that is, for me, like finding intermittent fasting personally was was like a game changer. Because uh, at the time, I, I, I had all those symptoms. I was uh, suffering from obesity, uh, diabetes, sleep apnea, high blood pressure, and so on and so on. So it's, and I was looking for a way of, of losing weight. And that, that was the first point. And then I stumbled upon your video where you, we talk about the various other benefits too. And the thing is, it's not a fad. This is not a fad. There's a science behind it. And you're mentioning here science. And it's a revolution because I think it is. It's yeah. free. We all have access to it. It is uh, a little bit difficult. And I, I'd like to talk about the process of it. And I'll share my own experiences, of course. It's a bit difficult at the beginning stage, but it has so many benefits. And I'm just surprised that not, many people or not enough people are doing it and just to point out this is not just if you're suffering from anything this is also for healthy people it gives various benefits so let's yeah let's talk about intermittent fasting which has changed my mind uh, my uh, my mind as well as my life in many ways yeah in the, in the the first chapter of my book i give like an evolutionary perspective on why it might make sense that eating intermittently and not breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks every day uh, might be better for health and, and function and performance. And it's pretty simple. Animals in the wild, and including humans, before the agricultural revolution, uh, often lived in environments or usually where food is relatively scarce. And they had, and it varied depending on time of year. And uh, they had to compete with other individuals in their own species and other species for these limited food sources. And so it makes sense that individuals whose brains and bodies function very well, perhaps optimally in a food deprived state, had a survival advantage, mm -hmm. right? So your brain has to function well so that you can try to understand or remember where food sources were or how to acquire them or compete with your competitors and uh, for many animals for predators it's kind of the easiest to visualize but i think it's also true for herbivores and and, and foraging animals including humans who used to forage a lot that um okay so if you're a predator say a wolf uh, they often go for a week, two weeks without killing a prey animal, you know, particularly in winter months, but even other times of year. And so 
they haven't eaten anything for say a week and they have to track down fine prey animals and then when they locate them they're going to be a distance away from them so they have to expend a lot of energy physical energy to catch them and kill them so that's kind of a a simple way, but I think it's absolutely right that, that food scarcity was a major driver of evolution and that our genetic programs and our our signaling pathways uh, respond to this challenge of food deprivation in ways that make them function better and be more resilient. But the initial experience, and for me, who who was obese at the time, not eating or or fasting was was hard to do. And I know when I was hungry, I could not think clearly. So it was the exact opposite, where I would just be moody, I'd be angry, I couldn't couldn't think properly. And I found it hard to even fast for my blood test the next day. It's like they said, ten hours of fasting, and I couldn't do it. But what I did is again following uh, up on your video. It's like, and people say breakfast is the most important meal, and now I counter with that as I well, I don't. I don't think so. I disagree with that. And we can get into that in a moment. But um, so once I started pushing it, it uh, it was difficult, right? The first like few days was was difficult. And you talk about it in your, in, in a video that I saw. It's like uh, yeah, I did have headaches. I did have fatigue. I did have nausea. But I pushed through it. And also against the advice of my uh, family physician back then, because I do I did have uh, uh, type two uh, diabetes and might not have it anymore. We'll find out soon. But um, and and it's the interesting thing though. And now, last time I saw her, she proposed uh, intermittent fasting to me. I was like, well, you know, <laughs> so years ago you said don't do it, and I still went along, and uh, and I survived. So I'm the guinea pig here, and I can tell that everything has improved throughout once you get through that slump. So uh, for anyone who wants to try it, who's never done it before, uh, what is the advice you would give to get through that first hurdles? And it's, it's probably up to a few weeks, maybe a month, but it does weigh enough. And you get to that point of that that wolf and you have that clarity. Uh, again, I can vouch for that too. Just personal experience as well. Yeah. That, so you, you jumped from the first chapter of my book to the last chapter. So <laughs> the last chapter of my book is essentially practical advice mm -hmm. for you know how people can incorporate intermittent fasting into their lifestyle uh say daily style, lifestyle like time restricted feeding not eating breakfast eat all your food within say six to eight hours i compress my personally i eat within a six hour time window every day i don't eat breakfast mm -hmm. yeah. get up get to work um but you're right it it takes several weeks to a month for your neural circuits and your the hormonal systems that regulate appetite and hunger to adapt to this new eating pattern. And um, one analogy I make in that regard is to exercise. If you've been sedentary uh, for a long time and then you go out and, and try to run, well, even a mile probably if you've been completely sedentary, you're not going to be able to do it. You don't feel good. You're a little frustrated. Um, but if you can stick with it, you know, over time, several weeks, a month, you start to get in shape. So what's happening during this tra transition period? Uh, it's two to a week to a month. So you're right. Initially, like if you've always eaten breakfast, tomorrow you don't eat breakfast. You're going to be hungry, irritable, can't concentrate in the morning. Um, and that will last several days, maybe even a couple of weeks. But once you're adapted, then a lot of people's experience is, and we think we know what's going on in the brain, actually, too, and with their hormonal systems, is that once they're adapted, not only are they no longer hungry during the time period they'd previously been eating, but they're actually, their brain functions better. They have more mental clarity. And this has been described a lot for long-term fasting. You know, historically, there's all sorts of things you can find, particularly from the, you know, the uh, literature and religious figures and so on. But um, there's good data now to suggest that that's actually true. So 
I had a postdoc who, we, we wondered why that is, what's happening. So we took mice and we maintained them on every other day, every other day food deprivation for different time periods. And then this postdoc, he recorded electrical activity from neurons in their hippocampus. We knew that already that animals that were adapted to intermittent fasting for a month, they have kind of less anxiety. We have we can kind of test their anxiety levels and, and they do better in certain tests of learning and memory. And what we found is really interesting. So one week after starting intermittent fasting, we didn't see any significant changes in the electrical activity. That, but then, interestingly, by two weeks, two weeks, and much more so by a month, we saw an increased uh, what we call GABAergic tone. Uh, GABA, I mentioned glutamate. It's the major. I, I actually wrote a book on this recently. Oh. Did you know that? No, I did not know that. Okay. So I, I don't know if people are watching. Sculpture this, and... this, this, this was just released a few weeks ago. It's called Sculptor and Destroyer, Tales of Glutamate, the Brain's Most Important Neurotransmitter. Okay. And so anyway, 90% of the neurons in our brain, the neurotransmitter they use is glutamate. Neurons that use dopamine or serotonin, uh, or other neurotransmitters, they're very few in number, less than 1% of the total neurons in the brain. And uh, the only way those other neurotransmitters affect brain function and be our behavior uh, is by modifying the ongoing activity in the glutamate, the circuits that use glutamate as a transmitter. But anyway, there's an inhibitory neurotransmitter called GABA that I talk about in this book and elsewhere. And it, drugs that, the initial drugs that were developed to treat anxiety disorders mm -hmm. were drugs that activate yeah. the GABA receptors. Uh, this goes way back. There's one called diazepam or Valium is the kind of the common name, but and now there's other drugs that are used, a lot, a lot of them having to do with serotonin, actually. But okay, so anyway, the bottom line is within about two weeks, we saw an increased kind of uh, constraint of the ongoing neural activity to keep it within proper limits so that the brain functions really well. And, and we think this may explain if this is what happens in humans. It may explain, you know, initially you have this kind of hunger, anxiety, irritability, but then after you're adapted, <laughs> you have almost calmness and able to focus better. Yeah, absolutely. So I think anxiety is, is really important here because that, that brought me into this state in the first place. That was the cause of it, right? again, stress and anxiety, toxic stress. And so uh, what happens is I try to deal with those emotions, but then once you do intermittent fasting, what happens, I mean, overeating, I think may mainly is because of anxiety. It's not, we don't eat because we feel hungry. We just, we feel the need, we're compelled or we're drawn towards uh, fast food and uh, food that is not good for us, junk food. There's, a, there's an addictive component. It's, exactly. that it's, it's been shown pretty clearly that people with obesity have, that show similar changes in their dopaminergic signaling pathways similar to people addicted to drugs or exactly. alcohol and exactly. alcohol yeah, yeah yeah so it was this vicious cycle and then so once i started dealing with those emotions while at the same time implementing intermittent fasting what intermittent fasting did for me i lost weight i lost about 50 pounds which was amazing but then it plateaus actually so i don't know what happens and we, we, can, we can talk about that too but um what happened was also i felt in control I felt in control of, I can go without food for a certain amount of time, even add an extra hour to it and I'd be fine. I did not have, or did not feel that control before. And I think that's hugely important because it also builds our confidence the same way like a runner says, I can do a mile now. And we do get those endorphins too, right? It's like the, the, the high we get as uh, when we're doing exercise, 
in a way, we get away intermittent fasting without having to do exercise, which I find also uh, uh, fascinating, although nothing against exercise. But um, I think that being in control and not being driven by that. And I still have junk food and fast food, but it's when I feel like it. And I think that makes a huge difference. I'm not compelled to eat it. And that gives me a lot of freedom to and confidence in, in myself. Yeah, and and also, but you know, when you're when you're overweight or you know, with obesity, you're you're worried about it, and you're you're kind of constantly. I would think a lot of people are trying to count calories every meal, and kind of, kind of a, that's anxiety get, to me. I think that's a part of anxiety of a, feeling it. And with diabetes, I took diabetes classes, and they said you can't skip a meal, and you have to eat, and you have to eat constantly. Right. And I, I did not like that from the beginning, from the get go. No, there's there's been multiple clinical trials, and and by the way, there there have been a lot of studies done in humans now with intermittent fasting. Um, a lot of it, probably most of it, in people with overweight or obesity, but a number of studies in patients with type two diabetes, they're you know they're able to improve their hemoglobin A one C levels and their their fasting glucose levels and insulin sensitivity, essentially. That's what we saw in animals when, you know, we did the initial work on that a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and what's interesting, so I was at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, uh, the National Institute on Aging, where I headed the neuroscience research there. And, you know, so we're, a lot of this work we were doing there at, at NIH, and so obviously I, I knew the sign. I knew the director of NIH, and I knew our uh, director of our institute, and so on. And they were seeing our results in animals. And then I cl collaborated in a couple human studies where the clinicians did the work, but we helped out measuring various things in blood samples that they sent us. And and actually, this is an interesting story. Um, so in 2007, we published a small study in uh, where we looked at every, we call it every other day caloric restriction. It was every other day kind of major calorie restriction in asthma patients. Mm -hmm. So these, all the patients were overweight. They had moderate to, moderate to severe asthma. And we had them go on a regimen where uh, every other day they ate only I think it was 400 calories, four or 500. I think it was 400 in the form of a shake, you know, that you drink. And so they were on that regimen for two months and the clinicians monitored, well, they have ways to monitor their symptoms and um, and the airflow in the lungs, right? Respirometry. And then we did a lot of blood work and very interesting. Um, by two weeks after beginning that regimen, there wasn't, there was kind of a trend towards improvements in their symptoms and airflow and some markers of oxidative stress and inflammation in the blood. Uh, but by a month, uh, there was very striking, highly significant improvements in their symptoms, airflow, and reduction in blood markers of inflammation and oxidative stress. Then we did a study with um, a group in England, which, you know, I think it really kind of ignited the internet virality of intermittent fasting. And this was a study, Michelle Harvey was a clinician. She has an interest in breast cancer in particular, and so works with women, uh, with or at risk for breast cancer. And so we did this study, 100 women randomly assigned to what's now called 5-2 intermittent fasting, where two days a week, they ate only about 600 calories each day. It was consecutive days. The other five days, uh, they didn't, uh, they ate as they normally would. And then the, the control group, we actually had them eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner but their daily calorie intake, calorie intake was about 20% lower than what they normally take in. And the reason we did it that way is we calculated that the weekly calorie intake 
you know, the calories for the total week of both groups should be the same. You know, 600 calories on those two days and then 20% reduction. <laughs> so over six months, both groups of women lost the same amount of weight. They had improvements in glucose regulation, <laughs> number of other um, parameters, health indicators. But the women on 5-2 intermittent fasting had a greater improvement in insulin sensitivity than did the women who were on daily calorie restriction without you know, any intermittent fasting spaced out meals. Kind of the key thing here from a mechanistic standpoint is this metabolic switch from using carbohydrates and, and, and glucose derived from the carbohydrates to using fats and ketones as the energy source. If you eat breakfast, say at seven in the morning, lunch at noon, dinner at seven, maybe a snack. Um, and it, and it, particularly if you don't exercise, you may not have this metabolic switch from glucose to fat and ketones. So I think a lot of people who are eating three meals a day, uh, they're gaining weight because they're never tapping into the their fat stores. You know, so whether you do this by daily time restricted eating, it takes 12 to 14 hours for this metabolic switch to occur. So if you do say six hour eating window, then you're fasting 18 hours, then you've been six hours, you know, of using fats and ketones. Um, also, if you exercise, which is what I do during that period, um, you get a bigger boost to the the metabolic switch, higher levels of ketones, but also we think that there's kind of a uh, at least additive, maybe we don't know synergistic or just additive uh, effects of combining exercise uh, with fasting. We actually had a, a study in, uh, this was in animals, we looked at the effects of intermittent fasting during an endurance training on on the 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 training effects of the of the protocols so the bottom line is we if the animals were on every other day fasting during two months of treadmill training where we have kind of an escalating load over those two months and then we do a maximum endurance test at the end the animals that were on intermittent fasting during the endurance training had better endurance than the animals that were not on intermittent fasting during. There's a lot of interest now by uh, by uh, actually athletes. Uh, mm -hmm. One big deal of, um, among elite athletes, endurance athletes, is a lot of them are taking it's called ketone ester. It's it's essentially the 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 ketone that's produced by your body when you fast they're taking that and there, there's actually published studies suggesting that that can improve their endurance um so just, yeah. just to clarify you you put the rats on a treadmill to detect that oh that's wonderful yeah yeah, yeah they well you would start out by walking right just walking and then slowly increase the speed and then for the training, I think every every one or two weeks we increased either the the speed of the treadmill or, or the incline, you know, the angle. Mm -hmm. So we're increasing the load. It's kind of like humans would do, you know, in uh, training. So um, so hamsters would be relatively as someone who used to have hamsters. They're they're relatively healthy because they they do the wheel. They do like their their endurance training. Well, pretty much every day. It, it, interestingly, if you put running wheels in rats or mice throughout their adult life, they don't live much longer. Uh -huh. Maybe only five five percent longer uh -huh. than the animals that don't exercise. So that's rats and mice. Mm -hmm. uh, Whereas the intermittent fasting and the caloric restriction has a, you know, 30, 40, even 50% increase in their 
lifespan. And um, however, the those rats and mice, they don't die from cardiovascular disease. They pretty they they don't have cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. really at all, mm -hmm. no matter how old they are. Um, they tend to die from cancers, and um, so I mentioned the breast cancer, uh, Michelle Harvey, and so that study we published, and then a producer at the BBC picked up. He it, Michelle Harvey is in England, right? Mm -hmm. So when we published the study. This BBC producer, who's a, a medical doctor as well, he saw it, and then he did this documentary it's called "Eat Fast, Live Longer," mm -hmm. and it aired in. So we published the article in 2011. It aired in 2013. He came to my lab, and a couple other scientists' um, lab, and so that aired. And then this five two intermittent fasting got popular in in England and mm -hmm. then United States. And then there's other investigators like Sachin Panda at the Salk Institute, for example, who were doing a different variation on intermittent fasting, daily time restricted eating mm -hmm. and publishing. And yeah, and then, so now there's been, if you go on clinicaltrials.gov, which is a place people go to see what clinical trials are ongoing, and you just put in the words intermittent fasting in quotes, there'll be over 150 clinical trials of intermittent fasting uh, ongoing in patients with, still more in patients with obesity, diabetes, but also cancers, breast cancer, um, prostate, colon cancer, um, Interestingly, cardiovascular disease and and even heart failure, which is kind of interesting, um, and then some inflammatory disorders like uh, inflammatory gut disorders. So I guess my point there is that it's not a fad. <laughs> this is definitely <laughs> not. No, no. Yeah, no, it's not a fad. This is, <laughs> there's a lot of evidence occurring. Then the big question is. How does that get incorporated? How do you incorporate this mm -hmm. in the medical practice and and people's lifestyles given the dark forces? Uh -huh. I, I have a it's not a chapter, but I maybe I have a whole chapter. I have a whole chapter on the dark forces. Oh, uh, yeah. fast food, processed food industry, you know, monoculture like agriculture. Um, but also, particularly in the United States, the Healthcare industry is profit driven and has an an inbuilt bias against disease prevention and risk reduction. Yeah, and driven by benefits. I'm just watching uh, Painkiller, the the Netflix on Oxy content, and it's just like it's it's just horrifying. It's just terrible. What what is going on? And breakfast is the most important uh, meal. Was by cereal companies. Was that promoted by them to to get the product? Yeah, and, and they yeah. were. This goes way back to the beginning. The the first thing you said about it takes a while to adapt. Mm -hmm. So then that studies that they're that led to this breakfast is the most important meal were funded by the the breakfast cereal companies kellogg's and others and they the initial studies were in school age children and they would they get a group of children at, at school and then they'd have half of them not eat breakfast on one day mm -hmm. and that they all were normally eating breakfast, right? All the people, all the kids had before the study always eaten breakfast. Okay, so the kids come in. Of course, their parents had to agree to this study, but so half the kids didn't eat breakfast, the other half did. And then, you know, right before lunchtime, they evaluated the kids' ability to concentrate and so on and lo and behold the kids who didn't eat breakfast 
couldn't concentrate because they were just like you on the first yes. day that you yes. didn't eat breakfast, yeah. right? They weren't uh -huh. adapted to it, uh -huh. right? And so... Um, and I wouldn't yeah. do it with kids in the first place. I mean, even teens. We're, we're talking like committed fasting is, is not for everyone in that sense, right? So it's the age group that's important, or would you say it's for everyone? I think for overweight kids, mm -hmm. if it helps them, I've had pediatricians contact me and one who's is doing this now in New York City with kids with obesity. Now, these are kids in like, not even in middle school yet. It's, you know, it's kind of really sad thing. We have kids with obesity that when I, when I went to school, I don't remember maybe one kid who was clearly overweight and, yeah. but anyway, so what he's done is he, he gets the parents to switch their eating pattern to daily time restricted eating. Mm -hmm. And then the kid, their kid switches with them. You know, so the parent and the kid are doing it together. And this pediatrician knows about this two weeks to a month transition period and, you know, kind of coaches them on that and what to expect. And yeah, so I think um, I was thinking, and I, I wrote this in my book too, that so healthcare insurance will often pay for uh, drug rehabilitation or, you know, where you go into for rehab for a month or whatever. Because in, in some cases, anyway, people can kind of get over their addiction without help. I was thinking for people who just, you know, for whatever reason, haven't been able to to switch their eating pattern or get in an exercise program, uh, you know, like a one month, I, I guess you could call it not really inpatient, but they go to kind of a, a nice place, you know, with professional staff and a good environment that help them, you know, change their lifestyle mm -hmm. habits. And, and I think a lot of people at the end of that month would come out being able to stick with the new, their new lifestyle because they're going to be feeling good by a month. Exactly, feeling good and feeling in control, and that's what's lacking control, there when yeah. you're when you're addicted. Are there any studies with ADHD in kids if with intermittent fasting? Is there because that could be some we, we they prescribe medication very easily and uh, people are overdiagnosed as well. We we see, uh, but it, could that be uh, something to to look at for for those who uh, who are suffering from from that? It's possible. I haven't seen that mm -hmm. kind of study yet. The the anxiety anti-anxiety effect seems to be real yes um yeah so i think it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to do so one of the things it's it's a cure in many ways and I, I i've been cured from sleep apnea and i remember seeing the sleep specialist and that's not my family physician that's another person and who said to me well basically that's not cure so he said what you can do is you can have surgery and i said oh then i don't need to use my cpap mask anymore and he's like no 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 it will be milder and i said well that's not a solution and so with intermittent fasting i i haven't used that machine for the past two years because i'm fine i don't wake up out of breath and you said mentioned asthma earlier it does apply to sleep apnea as well so i think yeah. uh, that should be tried out prescribed first if it doesn't work go back to your traditional ways of medication and pharmaceutic but uh, if you can, try it out. And I think that 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 is missing. It's getting better. My, my family physician suggested it to me, so that's a good sign. But the dark forces are still around. So, and it's a lot of ignorance too, and misconceptions about uh, about things like that, like intermittent fasting. So um, I wanna also talk about the prevention aspect of it, because here we have a thing that is again free, that does not have side effects. There are minor ones that you can deal with over a period of months, max. And then it has so many benefits, like even Alzheimer's, and you mentioning cancer, certain types of cancer, and cardiovascular diseases, and so on, obesity. We, why is there such a, a hesitation to, to embrace that again, when it has already, this science shows us that it has, and it optimizes our brain as well. So there's so many benefits to it, and very little, very few drawbacks, if any. 
Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's the same piece, reason that, multiple reasons, right? The pharmaceutical industry and general healthcare industries are all geared to people getting sick and then treating their illness. Um, phys physicians, you know, they may mention it, which is good. <laughs> you know, and, and certainly, uh, Anytime someone goes in for a physical exam, you know, say they're overweight and their A1C is getting up a little or, you know, kind of borderline pre-diabetes or something, the doctor will tell them, well, you should get some more ex get more exercise and cut back on your calorie intake. Uh, you know, don't eat simple sugars. And that that's good. But then they turn them loose for a year until their next physical exam mm -hmm. with there's no follow-up this is what i'm saying it's true they, they don't have a in place a mechanism to follow up and sort of cheerlead the person and you know and it's, it should be easy nowadays right with the the modern media things text messaging whatever social media that the doctor themselves wouldn't have to spend a lot of extra time you know, to follow up, but, you know, and, and maybe, maybe have like a shorter term follow-up appointment, like after a month, mm -hmm. you know, say, I'd like you to switch to daily time, restricted eating, whatever, eight, six or eight hour time window for a month. Uh, we'll be in contact you with you during this month to see how it's going. And then I'd like you to come back after a, a month and we'll, we'll measure your A1C again. We'll look at you know, whatever blood pressure is. Did your blood pressure go down some? I did. Yeah, I used to have high blood pressure and I don't anymore. And that's when my family physician asked me, it's like, well, how did you do it? Because I didn't take her medication yeah. that she was prescribing. So, yeah. yeah. So these, by about a month, uh, there should be measurable, uh, you know, beneficial changes in, in blood pressure, markers of insulin sensitivity in particular. There's other wondering, things. Yeah, go ahead. Wondering if it's inflammation, because I think inflammation is a culprit for various things that we have, especially cardiovascular uh, health and disease. So um, is, is, is that one of the main issues why we see all these benefits? Because you're actually actively dealing with inflammation in your body, which is caused by stress, by food that we eat, by lack of exercise and so on. It's an important part of it. There's good data that it, that intermittent fasting does suppress inflammation, and um, so yeah, it it'll be interesting to see how these. So, a lot of the data is based on animal studies where you actually you know where you can control things very precisely, measure markers of inflammation. But there's data I mentioned the asthma study, right? We measured. <laughs> markers of inflammation in the asthma patients were, which were down. There's other studies by other groups in humans showing uh, improvements in inflammation. So we'll just see, you know, I, I'm pretty optimistic that some of these ongoing trials are gonna prove positive and then maybe more and more, hopefully at an accelerated pace these things will be dealt. But I'm, on the other hand, I'm still a little concerned because of the way our healthcare system is geared uh, towards not investing much in risk reduction and prevention. There's also other things, um, transgenerational um, adoption or propagation of poor diet and lifestyle mm -hmm. choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In other words, in, in the United States, uh, in, in general, the, the southern states have higher incidence of obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and they get less, less exercise on average, and, and they're overeating. But then, so a kid grows up, and their parents you know, eat junk food a lot, too much, and don't exercise. And the kids grow up in that environment, right? Yes. And and with those habits. And so they adopt more times than not, more often than not, adopt those habits of their parents, whether, you know, 
you know, it can even be subconscious, right? You know. Yeah. So I think that that's something that's hard to get at too. So education is really the only way that I can see to really get at that. Um, and to talk about it in schools, I think that's again uh, ah, promoting yeah, yeah. it. You know, yeah. I think there's uh, not. I, my son goes to high school. There's no mention uh, of that even in the science classes. And I think that kind of like opening up the curriculum for that. I want to have a. I have a question about coffee. Is uh, so I I. I I'm addicted to coffee. That's one of my few addictions that I have. And I think it's fine. I've heard like some studies that say it's good. Some say it's not good and so on. But generally, I think overall it's good. But I incorporate, I had coffee, but without the sugar. So I eliminated the, the sugar. So that does not interfere with my fasting, right? Otherwise, I've no. been doing it wrong for me. Okay. So, so, no, so and the, the, ca the caffeine will boost your alertness a little bit. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah. yeah. And I do need it. No, I think that's good. Yeah, I do need it. Okay, I, that's good. I drink green tea without okay. anything. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the other thing I want to pick your brain uh, on is um, the radiation and uh, iPhones. There's a new study about the iPhone 12. Is that something to worry about? Because that's my phone. Is that something that I should be worried about? Or is it? I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, okay. so sure. I don't know. Um, I'm actually I'm working on a book. It's going very slow on hormesis. You know, the notion that subjecting cells and, and organisms to mild stress makes them more resistant to a subsequent, more severe stress. So mm -hmm. exercise is a good example, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this is very well documented with things like heat stress or um, uh, metabolic. Actually, we think fasting is a mild stress. Mm -hmm. A use I'm stress, sure. right? It's been considered here. That's yeah, yeah. the the, the yeah, perfect use, use thing. Stress. Yeah. yeah, and and, and I, uh, I think that's that when people like to prevent Alzheimer's, they say to 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 use your brain to practice things to keep yes. your brain in movement. And the intermittent fasting does exactly that as well. I mean, if we add like intellectual stuff to it and cognitive stuff, and then do intermittent fasting, you have the perfect combo of of health and prevention in many ways. When when you when you engage your nerve cell circuits in intellectually challenging things like we're doing now, mm -hmm. um, they're under increased stress. They're working harder, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just like your muscles when they're moving. They're under stress. When your neurons are active, they're under stress. So that mild stress is good as mm -hmm. long as there's a, a recovery period, which is very important. So. In fact, we think that the stress during exercise, during fasting, during you know really intense deep thinking, um, there's activation of certain gene programs that will increase resistance to stress. But then, if you don't rest, uh, you know, if you don't rest, eat, sleep, then you don't get growth and plasticity of the system. So we think these, you know, cycles of mild challenge, mild stress recovery, challenge recovery, challenge recovery, uh, can, can optimize health. Um, yeah. Well, you definitely activated uh, my brain and uh, our audience's brain here with, with such wonderful knowledge and insights. Um, so thank you so much. And I think just to look, uh, look at a car analogy, I was just thinking, it's like you put on the brakes with fasting and then you fuel your brain. And that's, you fuel it with, uh, again, concentration, focus, and so on, and various many uh, health benefits. So we, we can conclude that definitely those, uh, it's not a fat. And uh, if people are in doubt, after the podcast, you can still read the book. Uh, the book is The Intermittent Fasting Revolution, The Science of Optimizing Health and Enhancing Performance. You also have a podcast where you talk about the brain, uh, brain ponderings. And uh, so I, I encourage people to, to, to listen to that as well. And so we have uh, Mark Matson, a neuroscientist, professor, author, and podcaster. And uh, you're affiliated with uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University National Institute of Aging. Thank you so much for being here on Arash. It's been such an honor and pleasure to, to have you on and for you to, to share and also answer my questions, which were lingering here. But thank you so much for clarifying so many things for me and my audience here. Uh, you're, you're welcome, Arash. And, uh... You know, I'm, it's good to see that it's kind of gratifying to see that some of our work is 
healing to improvements in people's lives. So. Life-changing, and that's yeah. not an understatement. Thank you so much again. Okay.